Today I am throwing the little gift tumblers. Like these that I include with um, orders wherever I can. And I really like this shape because um, it will fit inside uh, a mug so you don't need to accommodate any bigger packaging for it. You can, I mean, it adds to a little a little bit to the weight, but it doesn't, you know, need a bigger box, so it's very efficient from a shipping point of view. Um, and as you can see, I've got quite a few because I've got, uh, yeah, you can see both shelves, so you can see all the pink things. This is the Valentine's update. Um, tomorrow, as I record this, I'll try and get the video uploaded today so that it's uh, relevant. If not, I'll upload it tomorrow, but the point is that the update is going live, which is mostly Valentine's pink things. There are a few other pieces that I'm really happy with. So I've done this series of um, slip dot flowing pieces. There's a, a few, but basically I was testing a few different glazes. So I've got kind of a version, same outer glaze, but this one uh, fades from Borealis to Glacier. This one's just Borealis. Um, and yeah, the normal storm blue sunset. The recipes for these are up on Glazy. I'll post the other recipe at some point soon. Uh, and sit down and do all that. And then the other thing that's quite fun and new for this one is I've got the speckled slip uh, with Blizzard inside. And Blizzard's the other, the original speckled glaze that I made using cobalt speckles. The recipe for that is up on Glazy. Uh, and then I just adapted it slightly to the pink, which, as you can see, same sort of principle, speckled, um, speckled darker pink and white in a pink base. But anyway, all of those will go up tomorrow, which means I want lots of the gift tumblers. Hopefully I should have enough for the update. Um, but these are going to be for the batch of... Um, standard pieces that I've thrown since. So, basically all I use is somewhere between 100 is probably the lowest, uh, that sort of size, it's almost not worth doing. They end up really tiny. I don't think I've got any of the, every now and then I throw one with a little too much, a too little clay and it ends up kind of, you can't really use it for anything, but somewhere, so say 120 to 180 grams is a nice sort of range. They're really quick and easy to throw. Um, the hard thing is that you've got to, f well, you don't have to, depends how busy you are. But I always kind of forget to make these as I go. And, oh, I don't know, very well. um, and I can work through a batch of orders and then realize that I haven't thrown any of these. But if you make them as you go there, they only take a couple of minutes total per piece, so they're, they're very quick and easy. And I've always felt that a little free gift goes a long way. Like, it doesn't have to be anything extravagant. These aren't, um, they're not time consuming, but they're great little espresso or um, shot glass kind of cups. And more to the point, it's that something you didn't expect, um, which I always think um, counts a long way towards kind of how much you like enjoy unwrapping something. If you know what's going to be in there, having something that you didn't expect in there is sort of counts double. So even if you're sending out the greatest mug ever, if someone's bought that, they know what they've bought. So I always like to include something else extra, um, with the added bonus of if the piece that someone buys uh, is a gift for someone else, it gives something that they can keep. So I kind of you win both ways, but um, I always think it's worth doing. And wherever possible, I will include one. Occasionally I run out of them 
um, for things that need to be sent and in that instance um, I might send one out without, but I try to avoid it. The shop update will go live at 7pm GMT uh, on Sunday, which I think is sort of early afternoon to late morning in America, and probably a very inconvenient time if you're in Australia or New Zealand. And I, I'm not sure whether it's... Cause a lot of my orders go to America and Canada. And I try to pick a time that sort of works for both, and that's why I do it on a Sunday, so that it's a day that people can be around more. But it does obviously mean that it doesn't work for people on the other side of the planet. And I don't really know whether uh, whether or not I should try and split it and do half and half. It gets a bit complicated, so I haven't bothered, and I apologise to any Australians or New Zealanders who either have to get up at a very antisocial time to get a piece or miss out as a result. Uh, if anyone has any great suggestions for a way around that that's, that makes sense and doesn't um, complicate things too much, I would love to hear it. I'm throwing these in the dark clay, which is a clay called anthracite, it's a German clay. If you're in the UK, you can get it from the clay cellar. Nowhere else seems to import it. And it is hands down the best dark clay I've ever used. And I would be very sad to see it go, because I, unlike with my light clay, where those of you that have been following along with the light clay saga know that um, I had a big issue with it and I had to find replacements. There were a few options there. I actually wouldn't say spoiled for choice, but there certainly were... Yeah, there were a dozen choices, I reckon, and a few of them were good, and two of them I'd have been perfectly happy to do it, everything with in its place. I genuinely don't think there's any Cone 6 dark clay in the UK that um, is anywhere close to this. Certainly nothing I've ever used. The only way I've seen of getting a good dark clay is by adding black stain to, or colour whatever you add to it, colouring a, a, a white clay dark yourself. It's some nice brown clay, there's nothing, this is a, a really dark brown. And I think it's a bit greyer in reduction. I'm not sure about that. And I would love to find out at some point. I have been considering getting a uh, probably something like 180 litre laser gas kiln because the pottery craft sell them and they're not that expensive runoff gas bottles so the setup is fairly minimal apart from the fact I want to build it a shed outside um, it can't come in the studio and that part's a bit of a faff but there are, I think it's about £2,000 for 180 litre, bearing in mind that puts it per litre at significantly less money than an electric one, their electric ones. Obviously it's a, it's a new but not sophisticated gas kiln, so it's not going to do anything radical, you've got to babysit it the way you would any gas kiln that isn't a blow. Um, but I did look into blau pricing, uh, that's what Kurt Hamley has if anyone is wondering. The computer controlled can fire, the, the smallest one is also 180 litres I believe or thereabouts. Um, 
and it can do a cone 10 firing and it has active cooling so it cools itself back down in a controlled but much faster than normal rate so you can actually load and unload in 24 hours uh, which I can do with my small electric kiln the thought of doing a cone 10 reduction firing and unloading cool pots the next day is quite something um, but the downside is there I think it was approximately 10 times the price so rather than being two three thousand pounds for a kiln you're looking more twenty thirty thousand pounds for a kiln so we'll not be getting one of those unfortunately um, who knows what the future holds but certainly in the short term it doesn't hold one of them uh, but the laser kilns look good but at a price where I could probably uh, I might throw this out on Instagram and see what people say but um, and comment below if you've got any thoughts but I could do a pre-order of reduction versions of things so in theory in theory the blue glaze that I used to use for the peacock eye um, I got from John Britt it's called Celsa Chun you can find it in his Cone 6 glaze book he's got some pictures of it fired in reduction um, and it's this really nice bluey pinky purple um, and I sent some pieces off with that glaze on to be reduction fired as a test and it didn't change at all and I have no idea if that was a case of the reduction used wasn't enough or was timed wrong or what um, obviously John Britt has fired the glaze himself for his pieces and he has got it to reduce uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing reduction versions of um, the peacock eye pieces and it didn't change so I might come up with a, a new batch of glazes that will behave the way I want and are sensitive to reduction um, there aren't many things that are sensitive to reduction in terms of colorants it's basically copper is the main one um, and iron sorry and iron is quite sensitive but most other things will stay broadly speaking the same and I use a lot of cobalt to get my blues which won't change but some of my glazes use things that would change um, and it would be quite interesting to see those so I'm in two minds about it because if I did a pre-order for pieces in it then I've committed to figuring out how to get them to work to a level that I'm happy with in a gas kiln um, having never fired one before. The flip side of that is I reckon a new gas kiln, pottery craft support, great. I should be able to figure that out. Um, I'm really intrigued to see. I'd quite like to have my own bigger kiln. Because obviously in terms of the upper limit of the size of pieces I can make, I can make something that would fill my entire kiln at the moment. It's only a little, little 60 litre top loader. I've ordered uh, a KMT 818 from well, Scott, KMT 818 from Cremity in the UK. Um, that'll be delivered in about a month. But that is only a fraction bigger. So. I can make ever so slightly bigger things, but not big things. Whereas a bigger gas kiln, I could start making larger bowls, larger planters. Because at the moment, kiln space tends to be um, the premium. It's what makes the larger pieces expensive. Because to do a, a fruit bowl that fills the width of the kiln, or a plant or a vase that fills the height, um, obviously I can only get one of those in, it's displacing 20 mugs 
which I could charge kind of 50 pounds for, say, ends up being quite a lot of money. Actually, I mean, while I'm talking about that, because I saw it was trending in my um, videos and on my blog, the how to price your pottery spreadsheet. So I'll post a link to that just in case you haven't seen it and are interested. But um, I did a blog post and a spreadsheet on how to price pottery. Uh, the spreadsheet's a little bit complicated, but the principle is simple. That it's basically, you tell the spreadsheet how quickly you can make work. So how many of these you can make um, and then you also tell it how many of them you can fit in your kiln and how many you can fire. So essentially what your two limits are in terms of how much time do you have and how time consuming are your pieces and how big is your kiln and how frequently can you fire it to give two upper limits for the number of pieces you make. And so what I was just kind of alluding to there was that there's this discrepancy when you've only got a small kiln between the upper limit in pieces you can physically throw and do all the process for. Because to throw a bowl, you know, what, 10, 15 minutes? You can't spend too much longer than that on a piece before you've overworked it. Well, I say that as someone who only throws small pieces. But um, I generally spend three to four minutes on a smallish bowl, maybe up to 10 minutes if it's a big bowl. Um, trimming won't take me too long. Something like the Nautilus slip won't take me too long. Even if I'm stamping the peacock eye, that might take, I don't actually know for a bowl, but say half an hour. But I could make something that would physically fill my kiln and the time it would take me for the entire process is an hour. Um, which would mean that if I were producing only those and not selling anything else, I would only be able to make, well, I'd only be able to fire one a day and that doesn't include bisking. So realistically, you'd be looking at maybe four of them a week because they're all, they're as big as your kiln is. Um, say you get them so that you can stack them in the kiln you might get five. If you could, if they were fruit bowls and you could fit them all in. Even if you could get six, that's it. You can't do any more than that because each one fills your kiln. Which means you have to charge essentially an entire day's time for that bowl. Even though it's only taking you an hour, you could come in and throw a week's worth in a day and then just turn up to glaze them and fire them and fire them back to back. That leaves you with a lot of spare time and you've got to charge quite a lot for the bowls because you've reached the upper limit to how many you could make. On the flip side, if you had a very small thing, like a, a tumbler, but you were spending eight hours carving something really ornate in it, and actually there are people who, I can't think of any examples, but people who've been on the Potter's cast who have talked about how long it takes them to make a thing and they, they do really elaborate, beautiful work and they say, you know, it might take 10 hours to make a muck. Now you can't, well, some people can, but most people can't charge 10 hours worth of salary for a mug because that is a lot of money. Um, but also, you're coming nowhere close to your kiln capacity. Because a little tumbler, even in a kiln like mine, so say I was making like my medium tumblers, I could probably get 30 in a kiln. So you could, if you were spending a day on each one of them, you could fire your kiln once a month, or well, twice with bisque. But, um, so you're nowhere near the capacity. So what you really want to be doing as a maker is looking at those two variables and your limits on two of them and doing some work that is limited by 
each of the, the things. So something quick and big and something small and intricate. They pair together perfectly because now you're, you're filling your kiln and you're also filling your time. And then you don't have to try and charge a ridiculous amount for either one of them based on the limit of the other. So what the spreadsheet will do is you input those and it will tell you how much you need to charge, how much you'll earn a month, because it does both. Um, you tell it how much you want to earn and it will tell you how much you, want, you need to charge, and it will you tell it how much you want to charge and it will tell you how much you earn. Uh, it's just basically the, the calculation forwards or backwards. Um, and chances are you'll find that actually you probably don't have anything in either extreme and it doesn't doesn't vary that much but I do find that um, because I've got the stamped or there's a few of my things that are like the, the tumblers that are quite small um, but have a, a time consuming process to them but I do have pieces at either end of the thing just so happens that most people want mugs, which is quite convenient because they're not insanely time consuming, but they are time consuming enough that um, even with a little kiln, I kind of, I fill it and fire it often, but I'm not limited by it. Uh, if most people wanted large fruit bowls, I would have had to have bought a bigger kiln by now because it's just not efficient. It's, it's no good for that. Um, but yeah, that spreadsheet's up. Um, if you've got any, if you notice anything wrong with it or you've got any suggestions for revisions, please let me know. Uh, it's something <coughs> probably did a year and a half, two years ago. And I don't actually refer to it that often now myself, but. Um, it is quite useful as an exercise to, to do it once. It does involve working out roughly how long each piece takes you to make. Um, the spreadsheet has, a, has boxes for each component of something, so you've got to take into account throwing and wiring off and trimming and glazing and loading the kiln and packing because obviously it's no good thinking like these things they take me a minute and a half to throw but um, that's obviously not the sum of the time that's probably not I mean I reckon overall overall they probably take 10 minutes so I I'm gonna guess at roughly a sixth of the time being throwing and that's without any additional processes just because I and I'll see if I can find the videos for these as well but in terms of my timing videos I'll talk about this but I leave them on the bat I'll get them back on the wheel tomorrow once they're a bit drier and I will trim the wall thickness the way I want it and um, smooth the rim trim the rim a bit thinner uh, it lets me trim them the way that I want to and obviously because they're still on the bat they're already centered and lets you correct a few things like the rim on this one's not great but I can wire off, well, not wire off um, needle the top off and then re-trim it while it's on the bat so very convenient adds a couple of minutes then there won't be much trimming because I've already trimmed the walls down but I'll do that the next day um, Loading it for a bisque kiln is only going to take you know, 10 seconds per piece or whatever. Uh, then you get it out. I've got to wax resist the bottom. Now, again, probably 20 seconds a piece, maybe a bit more. Then pour the inside glaze and dip the outside glaze. Depending on how I'm glazing it, that can be more or less complicated. The ones that I showed you earlier, same glaze inside and out, so they only take a short amount of time but again it's it might be a minute etc etc so it's worth having that ballpark figure in your head because um, if you just look at how long something takes to throw and even if you kind of look at the main processes like 
uh, throwing, trimming, putting a handle on. If you're missing the time it takes to glaze, the time it takes to put it in the kiln, because that always takes longer than I think it's going to, um, sand the bottom, uh, etc. You know, you, you can't. They are time sinks. Even little quick pieces are still time sinks, and bigger pieces more so. And it's worth having an idea in your head of a realistic number of things that you can make a month. Just because it's very hard to know if you're charging a sensible amount without that. And if you've done the spreadsheet and you're sure that the numbers there are correct and it's saying to charge more than you are, I think you can be quite justified in increasing your prices. Because it can be very easy to think, oh, but they're so quick to make, uh, how can I charge that? But um, you have to value your time at something. And if you think you're worth an amount, then charge it. Because otherwise you'll start to resent doing the work for less. I mean, obviously there's a bunch of caveats to that. Um, if you're doing wholesale, then it's sort of a transactional thing that requires a bit of movement in the price because the people that you're selling to have to make money but don't feel that you have to give away all the profits because at the end of the day it's still got to be worth your while. Um, for me, and this is just where I am at the moment, I'm very much leaning towards it not being worthwhile. I like the thought of not having to spend so long boxing orders to send out because that is another area that does take quite a lot of time. But what I have decided is that actually the time save from putting everything in one box um, is a bit different if you can deliver them to a local store. But even then you've got to factor in the time to get them into a, a state where you can drive them and um, you know, and then your time to drive, and it all adds up. But uh, yeah, the time saved from putting them in one big box versus several little boxes, I don't actually think is that much. Once you've sanded the bottom, which you've got to do if they're wholesale, you know, you're sending out work that's equally good. Um, you've sanded the bottom the way you normally would, so you've spent exactly the same amount of time up until this point on that piece. Um, you've got to package it safely. So really what you're saving is possibly assembling boxes, which depending on how you do it is not that time consuming. So I, I don't think there's a particularly big saving. Uh, and from my perspective, if you can sell them direct to consumers, then it's much better to do that. Um, there will be situations where it makes more sense if you can sell to wholesale and if that applies to you then ignore this but if you're a potter kind of starting to take it more seriously and try and make a living from it my personal take is um, if you can build a following online and sell direct to your customers and have a good relationship with them. So you're sending stuff out that people are happy to receive and they're happy to have got something from you. That's infinitely better than selling through someone who doesn't have a relationship with you and won't understand the story behind the work. Um, and that's what makes this the, the story behind a piece is what makes it special really I mean there's absolutely nothing stopping Ikea slip casting those they could make the glaze you know, their factory in China they could churn out a million other things and they could probably do it such that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between it and one that I've thrown so the only thing that justifies 
the higher price point that I have to charge over IKEA is the fact that you can see me making them and you know why they're the price they are based on the amount of work that goes into them and kind of the whole story the, the materials the, the work process etc etc but in terms of an actual if you're just selling through a shop um, they have to deliver that story to the customer for them to appreciate it and some will some won't be able to but uh, if you can bypass that and sell directly to people chances are they know what they're getting and they know why it's special I like to think that the quality of these mugs is uh, well it's as good as I can get it and I've spent quite a while trying to make it every part of it as comfortable to use as possible and as well designed as possible uh, but what I will say is that IKEA do quite a good job so um, yeah I can't I, I, I'm competing on something completely different to IKEA and that's why you want to be in shops that, that carry that through. Um, and that's all a bit of a rambly way to say that um, thankfully this is the last ball of clay because I've sort of come neatly full circle to my shop will be open or the limited edition page of my shop will be open for sale 7 p.m. GMT Sunday the 7th with the Valentine's pink pieces if you missed them first time round and a variety of one-offs some new designs I've been playing with some of which may or may not reappear in future but um, in the meantime you can get those pieces and um, chances are you'll be getting a free gift too I think I've got enough um, I really hope I've got enough now I've told you all about them and also I hope it doesn't ruin the surprise if you do buy one after seeing this and expecting one but um, hopefully it doesn't. And if you do buy one, thank you very much. Um, obviously, support means everything because I wouldn't be able to do this, especially as I'm not wholesaling, as previously mentioned. Um, I wouldn't be able to do this if people didn't watch these videos and understand the amount of, well just understand the story really I suppose is the main thing because it's, it's, making pottery is uh, a strange profession in the 21st century in a way but it's all about how you arrive at the piece for that reason. So these are all handmade by me uh, in a slow methodical, thoughtful process rather than churned out of a factory and I hope that comes across when you use them. Um, and that's it, that's all the balls of clay I had. Um, a bit waffly if you watched this far. Thank you very much and I hope either there's something useful in this video or there's something that you like in the shop update or just that you're having a great weekend. Um, I'll post a new video probably midweek after I've packed and sent all the orders. Um, next up today is sanding the bottom of, I don't know, 60 or so. Oh, if you include those, probably 100 pieces, which um, for the record, uh, just because I've had a few people ask me about this recently, I've got one of the diamond core tools sanding discs. Uh, unless you're 
removing an awful lot of material from them. Don't get the 60, that's what I got first. It's too aggressive and will leave scratches on the base of your pups. But if you get one of the wheel mounted discs, they are fantastic for leveling a pup. Um, so I quickly pass everything across that just to make sure it's level. And then I use 120 grit and 240 sometimes to smooth the pot. But if you burnished it, again, other videos on that, um, you don't need to do too much sanding. So level, smooth. Unfortunately, when you've got a lot of them, it takes a while. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing for the rest of the day. Have a good weekend.